The guys claim that you are first on your chin. I I missed you guys too. Yeah, I had another meeting appointment. Was it interesting? You, there's no possibility to discuss something anyway in such a large group. Yeah. Okay. Okay. William, do, William, do I have your slides for the device pro? I don't. Oh, okay. Oh, got it. William, do you want to come over here? Do you need a clicker? Do, do you need a clicker or? All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on Friday morning. Here to talk, uh, here to give a bit of an update about the device flow draft. Um, so just a, a, a quick word on the status. Uh, we've actually already cleared working group last call, I believe. Um, there have been a couple of changes proposed, so I'll go over those changes. Um, uh, but hopefully we can uh, get this thing done pretty soon. So uh, a bit of a recap first. What is the, what is the device flow? Um, the device flow is... Uh, authorization flow designed for devices that have an internet connection, um, but maybe they don't have a browser or they only have a very limited um, input mechanism. In, in that case, the user will be reviewing the authorization request on a secondary device, like a laptop or a smartphone. So how it works is something like this. Um, the, the TV app, um, as an example, the TV app will display a, a URL that the user will need to visit on their secondary device and a code that they'll need to enter. The user then visits that URL on their second device, enters the code, uh, and from that point, it looks a little bit like a regular auth from a consent point of view. <clears throat> During that, the device continues to poll uh, one of the endpoints, the token endpoint, with a uh, with the device code uh, to see if the user has completed their action, um, and if they have completed their action, they'll get back uh, the refresh token and access token. So it's kind of like the authorization service sort of issued like an authorization code that's not actually yet valid. And at some point in the future, it may become valid or it may become invalid. That's kind of how it works. All right, so um, on to the important stuff. What changed since uh, 98? Um, the first thing is we had a fairly lively debate, I don't know if you recall, in Chicago on the user code param. So this was a proposal by James Manager from Telstra. And the idea was, what if we could include the user code in the verification URL? So if you're not familiar with the draft, uh, 
the authorization server responds with a number of different fields and the authorization, um, sorry, the verification URL is a separate uh, field to user code. And the intent is that these things are separately consumable. Um, but, you know, what if you want to do something like this, right? So what if you want to have a QR code or, you know, any kind of like non-textual uh, transmission of that URL? Um, depending on kind of where you are, like, I think, I think in America, people don't all really know what QR codes are, so we don't actually see this a lot, but it's kind of a good example. Um, you could replace that with a um, Bluetooth thing or what, what, whatever you want, any, any way of transmitting a URL. Um, so what we talked about, this was kind of, a, it generated a lot of debate, um, particularly because I said that actually uh, my own company's server won't be using this, so people are like, well, why are you putting it in there? Um, the consensus call was that it is worth doing. Um, so in the 06 update, we did actually document that with some um, appropriate security considerations. Uh, this is an optional enhancement, so uh, it, it's fairly well interoperable because the authorization server will still display all the information and we're actually requiring that the client still actually display the two pieces of that information separately. So if the user doesn't know how to process that thing, whatever that may be, um, they can still sort of fall back into it manually. And the, if, if the authorization server actually doesn't support um, that and the user happens to scan it, they're just going to end up at that URL and they have to type in the code anyway. So it's kind of like the, the client, it, it's completely interoperable in the sense that the client uh, doesn't have to actually rely on the server supporting it. It can, it can just sort of try it as a best effort and everything will kind of still work. Um, this is kind of one of the nice things about this, this flow is that it, it's sort of very, fairly durable. Um, what we see a lot of people doing is they might try some more advanced method of pairing, say, the TV to the phone. You know, maybe they have their own app installed. So, you know, um, you, you, you might, and this is like out of this spec, but you might like open up that app and, and, and do something uh, and then kind of fall back to, to this uh, standard flow. Um, so Justin, who I think is joining us at 3.30 3 in the morning, apologies. He's online at uh, 3.30 in the morning. Um, he posed, uh, there's a couple of open questions on the list that I'd like to go through. Uh, and just remember that the, the draft is sort of beyond the uh, working group last call, but so this is the last chance to finalize some of these uh, normative things. So uh, the first thing uh, he suggested was um, instead of specifying the user code parameter um, in, that, in that URL construction that I mentioned, what if the authorization server has turned a separate parameter? So just to be clear, currently the authorization server is returning two fields, a verification URI and a user code. And we have a normative text to say that you can join them together using a URL parameter. Um, Justin proposed an alternative, which is have three parameters related to this, where there'd be like a third kind of optimized uh, URL. So I don't know if Justin, if you're awake, uh, did you have any comments that you'd like to make at this time on that, since it was your idea? Oh, he's, uh, let, let him, wow. Hey, Justin, go ahead. We can see so, you. All right. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so the basic thought here, uh, William, if you could actually go back to uh, your, uh, your high definition TV graphic there. Thank you. Um, so this picture is actually impossible with the current spec. Um, because what you would actually get, uh, is example.com slash device colon user code equals W D G blah, 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 what's et cetera. And yeah, that, thank you. You would get that on the top line, that URL. And if you go, go back to the other thing, you would, you would get the plain code on the next line. Um, and then, then that QR code. So this this picture you you can't actually get this picture with the current spec. Oh, I, I think you can actually. So unless I um, say this, something, which is entirely possible. Um, right. I perhaps you are because uh, the um, device authorization endpoint is returning HTTPS colon slash slash example dot com slash device that part as the verification URI, um, and then it's returning a separate JSON parameter called user code with, the, with that value. Okay. And then the spec is basically saying, as an optimization, if you wish, um, 
and you want to display that verification URI non uh, sort of textually, then you can use a, a parameter, a standard URL parameter that happens to match the key of the JSON called user code and pass in the URL. So it basically tells you how to construct this optimized URL. Oh, okay. Um, so that's constructed client side then. I correct. All yes. right. That was that was unclear to me. Um, even in uh, in reading the new paragraph in six. Um, so let me let me reread that again, and I may have some um, some wording changes. So see, I thought that this uh, constructed URL was coming from the server. So that's my mistake. Um, but because I garden path on that, I'll I'll read through. Uh, what is that? Section three three one again, and um, and see if we can armor that a little bit better, so that somebody else doesn't do what I thought that you were right. suggesting that we're doing. So uh, that's good feedback. Yeah, great. Okay, fantastic. So I withdraw my um, uh, my proposal. I think whatever okay. it was. It's three in the morning. <laughs> Whatever the word thank, is. Thank you. thank you for joining this call. I'm All impressed right. to see you there. All right. Thanks, guys. I want to make the same suggestion that Justin was originally making for okay. a slightly different reason, um, and that is as it stands with just the two parameters, you are then requiring the client to do this construction of the complete URL. Uh, you're requiring that the user code parameter then be standardized and so the client knows what that is. Um, that's putting a bunch of work on the client, which historically doesn't always go so well. Uh, additionally, it's limiting flexibility on the part of the uh, the server because now the, you know, the endpoint that uh, receives the user code via query string and the endpoint that uh, the customer would type that uh, user code into have to be the same, which may or may not work out. They may want to use a different URL for the uh, parameterized endpoint, perhaps one that is going to be um, captured by their mobile app if it is on the device, um, whereas the simple to enter shortened form of the URL may not be. That's a good point. Oh, I um, forgot something important. Uh, I forgot uh, meeting minute taker. Oops. 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 Uh, <laughs> no, it didn't. Uh, Mike, can you take a few notes? Is that possible? Because you are not presenting today, or you have no laptop with you. Okay. <clears throat> you want to sit next to me? I guess that's the only table here. And that was from Annabelle Backman from Amazon, Mike, for your benefit. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> and um, for the Chaba, uh, can someone take a look at the Chaba room to see whether Justin or, or Hans or uh, Phil post some question? It's Friday. Yeah. So if someone could uh, could open the chat and have a look at it, uh, that would be great. You don't even have a chat. Right? Brian, do you have chat open? Okay. <laughs> you, okay. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. Um, um, yeah. So what is the conclusion? Uh, okay. Well, firstly, uh, to to discuss your point. Um, Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a good point. I guess you, you could have potentially two different targets for that. Uh, a couple of other things I thought about in trying to trying to come up with an opinion on this was also, I guess you can have a higher entropy code for, for that magical one. So that, that could be beneficial in some way. Um, yeah. I, I guess on, on the dis and, and, well, the other thing is that you would actually know that the authorization service supports that. Yes. Um, yeah. On the flip side, I guess it's uh, you know it's one extra piece of information coming down. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess both both are slightly complex, like you said. In in this case, I think the construction of the URL is very simple. So as as much as I would normally agree, like let's get everything away from the client as possible. I would really hope people couldn't make a mistake with this, but but maybe 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 they would. Uh, URL parameter encoding is hard. <laughs> I mean, it's not, but it's yeah. harder than we think it is. Yeah.
There's a good point. That probably should be added if, if we keep the uh, current text. Uh, uh, so for people that didn't uh, quite catch that, uh, uh, Dick Hart asked, is, is, the, is there a requirement that the existing user code be um, URL safe? Um, and I'm not entirely sure. We, we may specify an alphabet for it. We may specify a character range for it. Uh, I believe there's a character range required, uh, specified. Right, which I think is probably URL safe. Yeah, I was going to say, if it's not required, it's certainly highly suggested by the, by the characters suggested to be easily entered and remembered right. by the user. Right. Um, we, we wouldn't want the authorization server to attack the client, though, with some kind of weird malformed URL. Something in, in my experience I've seen with clients implementing ROS2 based services is they frequently aren't reading these specs. So yeah, I know, right? Yeah. So, so banking on clients having an understanding of what is in the spec and isn't and, and what the actual, uh, you know, what's reasonable to expect around the values of these parameters isn't necessarily a safe assumption as far as Right. Hoping that's going to make things easier for them. Right. Just let me know when I'm actually. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, so, oh, thank you, Leif. Uh, so, um, I, uh, to Brian's comment about uh, the character set uh, suggesting things that are easy to type, I want us to keep in mind that uh, that presumes a you know a U.S. style you know ASCII keyboard is in, as far as things that are quote easy to type. Um, there are lots of keyboards around the world that put lots of non-URL safe characters well within reach, and. Um, it uh, might make sense in other contexts um, to have things that are very easy to recognize and type that would still need to be URL encoded. So Annabelle's point about URL encoding, I think, does have merit. Annabelle, for the purposes of the minutes, uh, repeat for me from the microphone the suggestion that you were making because I sure. didn't capture it. Yeah, so Annabelle Backman, Amazon, um, kind of reiterating Justin's suggestion that we have a separate parameter that contains the, I guess, clickable URL that has the code embedded in it. Um, so there's two experiences we're talking about here. One, which is the, the primary one that uh, Williams presented, that is the customer user types in a URL and then types in a code. The alternative is the automated experience where they engage with a QR code or through some other mechanism, a URL is open that already has the code embedded in that. Have a separate parameter for that URL so that the client does not have to try and construct it. Uh, that reduces the amount that we have to standardize on these endpoints because then we no longer have to standardize a query string parameter for the, the user code. Uh, and it opens up flexibility for the server to use a different endpoint for that, uh, express the code in some other means, or have a, have a higher entropy code. Um, it just can decouples that from the streamlined for user entry experience. This is Dave Robin. I was I would not wanting to repeat everything she just said because I think it's great, but one other um, a possible wrinkle here or use case is that in this case uh, where you're presenting the, the, the typeable URL and the, and the typeable code, you're sending the user to a very UI, UX, HTML based server guy that's serving up human pages. He may in fact be turning around and sending it with a, an, a garbagey code to the backend server who's actually completing the operation. So with, there's some opportunity here to just send them straight to the garbage you got. You know, the, the, skipping the, the whole UI server, the one that's got pages and stuff to interact with humans. And, and so with this option with the QR code, they could scan that, go straight to the final representation guy with the, the right code, and just skip a step, skip a server. 
Stephen, get Robin. Just waiting for him to finish typing. So, uh, not Sakimura no research. Um, I support Annabelle's idea. I'm uh, in one of the, the implementation we have. Not entirely all. We actually do send URI, which is a good idea, as well as we kind of send QR code image itself. Okay. Because the terminal could be really dumb. Right. Right. Uh, the other thing is that um, I was just scanning user code <coughs> in the text, and I don't quite see the exact constraint on the user code. So. Okay. Um, actually, and also uh, to that point, uh, to somebody's point, it might be, you know, if it's a user code, it might be also a good, good idea to, you know, not to constrain too much, right? In, in the sense that, for example, if you're using Japanese phone, right, smartphone, it's actually much easier to type Japanese character than alphabet. So I have a question for you. If, if you could stay there for one second. So, so do you think that would actually make the most sense from a, a user point of view in Japan to to have a like a hiragana code or yeah, okay, that's much easier. Actually. Okay, so we should we should document it as yeah. Unicode. Yeah, but then that means that, but no, that, 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 that means uh, that, that's just possible. But but that means that uh, composability of URI is also gone. The card Amazon. Uh, we recently looked at stuff that people could type in across mm -hmm. the world. And concluded the digits work really well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that anything that's a char set, it's like it's confusing with different right. keyboards and all kinds of other lo locales. And so potentially just having it be just pure digits, because you only got 20 bits now, so you only lose half the res. And right. everybody can, knows what a number is. Yeah, I guess that's kind of why we landed on on the on the characters to, to double the. Right. but. Are you buying? I mean, all you need is one more, right? Character to one more thing. Out of curiosity, like how many how many numbers do you typically use in such a? I don't know if you're talking referring to this exact type of flow, but. Uh, no, not that exact type of flow. But we, as we, we're choosing things, we realize that numbers are much easier for a number of different types of input mechanisms. Right. right. <laughs> particularly when you move to voice. Right. Mm -hmm. Good point. So uh, Natsakimura and Nara again. Yeah, I fully support if we are just going to number. That's it. Even OK. Easy. I'd probably rather not do that, because it'll bring our running code out of compliance. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, think it's, I, I think it's an extremely good point. Yeah, I, I, I would, um, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the other dangerous things with uh, characters is you can accidentally create words, uh, which did actually happen to us. So we dropped all the vowels. So that's Sakimura again. Um, if you really want high entropy stuff, it's actually kind of good to send down the QR code image itself. You can clamp a lot of characters <clears throat> in it. Right. So uh, the QR code with the uh, the like as the complete URI. Like a, like a URI to an image which you download and is the code. Um, yeah, so I guess the only drawback with that is that it, it assumes that it's a QR code. So this, this in my example, was, was the example. Um, I guess I could see like NFC being another way to represent that, um, that URL, potentially. Uh, or you, you, mean like, you mean like adding another parameter? Yeah, I mean, the, the, so we are talking about optimizing user experience, right? Right. Yeah, so if it's targeting the QR code, then send the QR code directly. If we are targeting NFC, maybe it's a good idea to optimize towards NFC. OK, actually, I have another uh, localized usability question for you, if you have a second. Uh, so so do you, do you see like this actually being successful with QR codes as per this example in Japan? Yeah, well, uh, right, and you know, a bunch of ATMs are actually using that. Even not not with, even within Japan, but for example in Singapore, or I guess the same in uh, Austra Australia as well. 
so you know, to, people doesn't have to you know, carry around the mug stripe core, right. but just use their phone. And and you think that that parameter should that be additional to the additional parameter, or should that be instead of? That's a good question. Okay. That's a good. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, that's a good question. But yeah, if it's going <coughs> to be image, I, I guess it will have to be. Right? It's separate. Yeah. Okay. But then you know, well, you also have to think about. I'm not very familiar with the N NFC kind of things, but if you think about sending something for the consumption of an NFC device, and how to do that, that right. you may need another one. So you might have, you might, you might want to have. If, if the John Bradley Ubico, if the device supports NFC, just sending a URI over NFC is actually pretty well understood. That's okay. not, yeah. I, don't, I don't know that you need to send a set, unless you're doing something super complicated, just sending the, the if we had a separate URI, having the device send that over NFC, you ought not to need another parameter unless we're doing something <coughs> horribly wrong. It, so the only question is whether or not devices have a library to create the QR code locally or not. And or to make an HTTP call. Yeah. I mean, that's that's true. I guess it doesn't. That's true. There could be a remote uh, QR code generator. Yeah. So I guess like as as currently written, e even with the e even um, disregarding the decision between uh, the composability or not, um, the the kind of point was like, here's this URL that you can use. Transmit it however you want to transmit URLs. Uh, and so I, I did like the simplicity of that. And yeah. yeah, yeah. To that point, I think if we try and get into tailoring the spec to particular transmission technologies, we're, we're going to go down a huge rat hole of never ending. Do we want to support this? Do we want to support that? Yeah. Um, if we limit the spec to uh, getting the code from the server to the device and uh, give it with, with enough flexibility that the device can then get it to uh, a secondary device through whatever transport makes sense then I think we're solving the right problem. Right. Yep. A couple things, uh, Dickhart, again. It's not clear to me where we're really working our interop, right, as opposed to this just being a best practice. Um, so as I looked over the doc, there wasn't really anything that says, like, who are, when are they two different parties as opposed to all the same party? Because it's all the same party and do whatever they want. Right. Which may, means that maybe this is more of a good guideline around how to do it well so people don't do stupid stuff. But is there, it, it might be easier to sort of call it the use case where it really is requiring they are two independent people, right? Which, you know, OAuth is, you know, there is two different entities that are trying to yeah. get the flow. Yeah, so I mean, uh, Justin and I actually did, did do an interop test. Uh, his server and my client um, written completely independently. I, it doesn't. I mean, like, like, like a real, like, yeah. real world yeah. instance where the device and the server are from two different players. Yeah. Does that happen? I, I, I'm not aware of an example that comes to mind. Um, I guess that doesn't mean that there isn't one. Okay. So, 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 so we are, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, and I'm not sure that it would necessarily work. That we would necessarily want to do this. Um, because the, you know, the the model here is a very browser web oriented model, where the world's moving more and more to a mobile app model, right? right. So the the, the customers aren't going to go and pull out their laptop necessarily; they're going to pull out their phone. Absolutely. So they're pulling out their phone. Then you're really trying to bind the device to potentially an app running on the phone, and that the user's already authenticated into that app, right? As opposed to making the user authenticate into something in the cloud that they don't really have the credentials or anything for. And so I could see the QR code helping where you really scan it with a QR code, which essentially eventually launches the app on the phone. And so the user is already authenticated. And, right. and then really the only UX is an approval process by the user. Right. And, and in that case, like you're saying, you don't actually need the interop. Uh, you control both sides. Um, no, you don't. Oh, not, not always? OK. Right. So yeah. in the Alexa world, right, there's many third parties that are putting out devices, 
where you want to enable mm. that third party to make calls into Alexa. Okay. And so we do require some interrupt there, although we could just say what to do because right. it's our world. Yeah. But it would be nicer if it was standardized and it was more of a practice. But we would probably want more of a flow like that right. that I described than a flow that's very web oriented. I, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, also, I presume you may need a fallback in case the user doesn't have the app installed uh, or is using a device not supported by your app. Um, it's pretty hard to turn a device up. You, OK, it's actually a requirement. Yeah. I, I guess it's the, not, not a requirement, it's just hard. Right. Because. Uh, there, there definitely exists use cases I'm aware of where, where you may want like an optimized flow, but then you still want the fallback of the, yeah. of the browser. Yeah, so you still want um, the fallback. Yeah. But the, but the, you want the 80% case to work super quickly. Right, right. And actually, one of the cool things you can do with this, with this construction here is that you can actually use this as a pairing, a visual pairing confirmation code, too. So the fact that the data's already there, a bit like the Bluetooth kind of pairing, yeah. like, you know, yeah. is, the, is your TV. The thing I loaded, I scanned something, but is it really the is it really the thing? that particular yeah. device? Yeah. yeah, particularly helpful when you're working on the team and there's like 100 of those devices uh, yeah. in proximity. But also relevant for apartments and hotels. So. <laughs> uh, John Bradley, Yubico. <laughs> so I'm influenced by the arguments that having a separate pre-composed URI that could have a different endpoint and perhaps different ent amount of entropy than the user typeable one is probably a good idea, um, given that a lot of this will be either NFC or QR codes to, to an app, which is, I mm -hmm. think, a growing, or even audio to an app. I mean, there's a number of different ways. Um, I don't know that we should add the QR code directly. We may want to leave that as an extension so that uh, apps could have an introspection endpoint that gets a QR code right. for, from the URI, et cetera. Um, so I think that you know, trying to generically add QR codes or sound files, et cetera, should probably be left as an extension. But uh, I guess the other thing is that doesn't Google already do this sort of thing with printers? And there are, you know, Google doesn't yet make printers, but there are printers that use We have device printers flows. using this, yeah, absolutely. Right, so that is the case of a third party client. Okay. Oh, is that what you meant? Okay. Yep. Yeah, the, I mean, YouTube's biggest customer is actually YouTube's app. Um, but yeah. Right. Okay, no, that's a good point. The printer one is, is a good example. I, I, I guess I thought you were meaning like, would that printer, you know, potentially be doing this exact flow to another authorization server as well? And well, I, so what we have to do is care about the interop where the device manufacturer, i.e. Epson, isn't, or do they even still make printers? I don't know. Uh, that uh, they're, they're not providing the OAuth server. It's some right. either personal or, or some print service, which is offered by Microsoft or Google or whoever. Right. So we have to think about some of the interop things. I'll, I can also buy making the code numeric for for reasons, at least as a recommendation. All right, so I, I guess I feel like there's sort of two changes that we're proposing here. One is to move to a, a separate URI um, as the kind of optimized one and allowing any character in the user code but suggesting numbers. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Strongly suggesting numbers. Well, that we may not care about anymore. If you're saying they could kind of make up anything, you still want them to go and make it URL safe. Right, but only only with this proposal, I guess. If we move to the separate uh, URI, then I guess that, that doesn't matter anymore. Is that? Uh, you're, you're wanting the... Um, client to construct 
away from, move the, away from the client constructing. So if it's separate, then all what you're doing, all you're doing is displaying some UTF characters or something that they will right. get into a web browser. So the client would no longer be constructing the URI. If we combine the two proposals. Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, I just worry that clients doing stupid stuff of URL encoding something extra and then it breaking. So, like, if you're handing them down a URL, you'd want it to be a. If yeah, I, I think if we make it Unicode, then I definitely agree. Let's just uh, send a, se a separate URI. Uh, if yeah. that makes sense. So, um, I don't know. Do we, do you want to do a vote on that or a need or no voting? Oh, that's true. Do we need a consensus uh, call on any of these items? Um, no, that, that okay, um, we have passed working group last call, so fairly, good to yeah. not. Uh, I think that also sounds um, like fairly reasonable. I don't think we need to okay. like having a URL save and making recommendation to use numbers like uh, okay. who wouldn't. All right, so I think we'll just that catch that as idea. the decision then, unless anyone objects. Right. Um, so Mike Jones. Um, I guess, I, and I'll admit, I don't understand this well enough to make a really informed comment, but introducing a second endpoint that's distinct from the one that's already in the spec seems like a pretty big change to do at this stage in the game. Yeah, oh, that's the language people have been using, is having a separate URL and a separate endpoint. So what am I confused about? I was going to go up and say the same. I mean, it sounds, not to get into the details, but it sounds like a, a, a bigger change than a working group last call uh, change. And you might want to respin uh, another couple of weeks working group last call. Mm -hmm. So Mike, I, I believe the suggestion is to add a new parameter which has a pre-composed version of the URI which enables the user code to be have higher entropy and be pre-URL encoded which gets around <clears throat> the problem. I mean, we also need to think about the user displayable user code if we are actually using UTF-8 what is the script? There's, there's other issues that tend to send specs into a tailspin once you actually attempt to internationalize them in that way. Not that I'm saying it's bad, but just sending you to UTF-8 characters doesn't actually work for everyone. Um, but certainly, whatever we do with making the displayed user code internationalized, that immediately leads one to having a separate pre-composed URI. And I believe Annabelle made the suggestion that if you had a separate URI that you were sending, pre-composed URI, it could actually have a different path. But that would be an implementation detail. We're not saying that you need a different endpoint. But as an implementation detail, if you wanted to do, if the AS wanted to do an optimization, nothing forces it to have exactly the same path. I guess we will have to look at the text to see uh, how this how this ends up. A quick comment on the UTF-8 concern, because I think we, I'd, I'd like not to walk away here and have that whole thing blow up. Um, so I, I guess we're not going to require that clients can display <laughs> any character they get sent at them. Um, you, the authorization server would have to use its best judgment for the market. Oh, is it? So the, the client needs to know in some way what the script it's supposed to display the UTF-8 characters in. That the server on its own, okay. if, if, if these are actually interoperable separate devices, if you had you know, a, a Korean printer that knew that it was going to use Korean script, that, but as soon as that's shipped to South America, that's not going to work so well. So. Somehow, if, if we are actually allowing internationalized <laughs> characters as opposed to numbers, the script needs, it's not my fault. I'm not, I wasn't, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I think Dick's idea is looking better and better by the minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so 
I just suggested that the UTF-8 might be um, Japanese character would be easier to type than alphabet right. in Japanese smartphone keyboard. But I was just asking for something, some cons some kind of thing which is reasonable for people to type in, and numbers just miss it. Okay, so let me let me let me see if we if I get this right, we're we're, we're going to keep it the same. It's it's numbers. numbers and A to Z, please, so we don't break my interrupt. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If we're if we're sending, if <laughs> us sending characters shouldn't be harmful to your. Interest, Microsoft right? would agree. We're yeah. using letters. Yeah. So let's keep it as is and add in uh, internationalized like uh, usability considerations um, and suggest numbers as the as as that to solve that problem. Annabelle Backman, Amazon. Just to completely bury the UTF-8 discussion. Thank you. Keep in mind that the more complicated. Uh, the display requirements for the client, the more devices and use cases we exclude from being able to use this. The whole point of device code is that it is usable in scenarios where the device has constrained input and output. So if you're, agree. If, if you're trying to output everything in Unicode, that's going to be really hard on a really low res LCD display. I agree. I'm right. I'm, I'm sad. I'm sad that we won't be able to have a uh, emoji-based user code now. But uh, that was a brief, for a few brief minutes, that looked possible. And then quickly to to further address Mike's comment, uh, and John was right that I think we're we're not talking about necessarily a defining a separate endpoint. We're just talking about defining a separate parameter with a URL that may or may not point to a different endpoint. And bear in mind that the spec itself says nothing about what those endpoints do. It's very deliberately leaves uh, that up to the AS, just as OAuth leaves the process of uh, resource owner identification and authorization and all of that up to the implementers. Uh, this spec leaves everything that happens at these endpoints up to the implementers. All right, um, let you answer. So, so we went from here's a URL, type this in, and type in these characters to you know multiple, at least two ways you can get hopefully to the same place. Has anybody done security analysis on this? Are there any aspect, are there any security aspects involved in you know t two ways that are supposed to take you to the same place? We we should uh, we could talk to the. Security research and let them do include that in their formal analysis. Uh, they like to do that. I, I I have no idea. I mean, the, I guess part of the discussion we had at the last ITF was that the, there are, you know, when you when you present that the the like the first generation of this user interface, here's an input box, you know, type this, mm -hmm. right? That's like maybe harder to. To confuse or you get confuse users over or get wrong, I have no idea. But again, this seems like something shouldn't cr just crank this out in a in a last call uh, comment. This needs somebody to look at okay, it, it and re-review like, or. Something. It sounds like this change will need another last call. Well, we um, I, if we accept it, the change. Yeah, um, we have to look at the text, and and I yeah. think we uh, we definitely have to. Uh, Discuss it on confirm it on a mailing list. So, um, yeah, whether I'm, it would be big enough in the end uh, to have another working group last call, I don't know. But it, it shouldn't be a big deal anyway. And then uh, there was not a joke with the security researchers. Like they, we had this this meeting and they they offered help uh, with some of those activities. So we can, sure. we could, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, definitely one of the things I liked about the old way is that it kind of fall. It sort of falls back very nicely if if the if the server didn't understand the URL, it just displays the original URL anyway. Um, but I guess it shouldn't be sending something it doesn't understand in in the revised proposal anyway. So, Dave Robin, I'm, I'm. What do you mean hmm? by the old way? The current. I, I, the, I think the the to. the method documented in zero six, um, being the old way. I'm I'm curious to make sure we understand where we're ending up and where we're going with this because I think I heard two different things. Um, one is that if we make the uh, code you know, URL safe, then composition by the client is no problem. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to say a lot of things about it. Um, but 
also then we have this idea of pro providing you the complete URL, which requires no composition. So the question is, implementations aside, yeah. <laughs> are we deprecating what you show on the screen right now? In other words, the code is only for typing into web pages, and the compose URL is only for you know sending it as a parameter. Having what you have on the screen now of user code equals that, which is composed by the client somehow based on these two pieces, the first piece is one and two mm -hmm. to make this URL. Is that option still on the table? Other than, I mean, other than the fact that implementations are doing it today, perhaps. But if we have option three, if we have parameter three, I might make the case that client composition should never be done, and this server parameter of user code equals should never be allowed, that it's opaque because you know I'm that that just that user code equals URL parameter is just not a thing. Yeah, it, it's either opaque in case three parameter three, or it's never used in one and two. You go to one, you type two. Yep, I, I do agree. So we should document one or the other, not both. Absolutely, okay. and and maybe yeah. Okay, I thought we were running up with both. Absolutely, let's not do both. Um, let's pick one. I, Annabelle Backman, Amazon. To the security considerations point. Um, uh, there is text in version 06 of the draft that uh, brings up remote phishing concerns around the composed URL. So the, the current draft does actually address the, or at least raise the, the risk of you know, increased ability to trick the user when you're not forcing them to type in a code that they see on a screen. Um, so I would encourage anyone who's, who's Interested or concerned about that risk to review the spec and take a look at that language and uh, see if there if you have any concerns beyond what's addressed there. Uh, no, it's 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 more guidance for the authorization server around making sure that the experience they present through that composed URL still gives the the end user the ability to detect that phishing might be going on. Yeah, um, it, it, yeah it, it kind of ra raises the bar necessary for that experience, basically. Yeah, um, and a comment on phishing, I guess, like one, one of the things that we were trying to establish is basically, um, are you setting up a device and is that device currently in your possession? That was sort of the, the challenge that we were trying to answer. Um, and so when we were thinking about like what UI to show, uh, we were even thinking of asking that question, like is the device in front of you and is it displaying this code, you know, to try and mitigate that. I think that might be in the draft. Lucy Lynch, just a process thing. Hannes, I think these are enough changes that it's breaking for last call and that you would have to go to last call okay. again. Sounds fine. Thank you. All right, we do. Uh, there is another another open question. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let me let me uh, quickly go over this. So, yeah, we added some ASCII diagrams. So that's all good. Um, Justin uh, pointed out that uh, after discussion on the list, that while it's a polling protocol, there is no actual requirement that you have to poll at it. There's no requirement that you pull that interval, you can pull it at a slower interval, you can wait for user interaction to, to, to initiate a, a poll that would look more like a, a single request. Um, okay, so there is another another <laughs> last minute topic that was sort of proposed after working group last call. Um, this was an interesting one because there were kind of three people that kind of came up with it all at the same time. Well, not at the same time, but... <clears throat> and, and that is this question... Um, at least for the minutes in the working group, what is motivating people to want to make these changes now? I really don't understand what these are for. I, why, why isn't what we have fine? I, I guess I don't really know what their motives are, but I, I'm, I'm assuming that it was the working group last call that triggered some last minute reviews. It's, it's maybe and this. It's perfectly fine to provide these comments at this stage, even at the idea of last call. So I don't, I don't think I, it's. I'm not questioning process. I'm asking from an engineering perspective. Why do people want to do it differently than it's already specified? I don't understand that. I don't. I don't think they want to do it differently. Uh, my my sense is more like people, and I've seen this in other environments. Um, since we are further along in the process, uh, people look at this and found out that they can actually use this document to cover some of their use cases, specifically some of the IoT use cases. Uh, and in fact, actually experienced that myself in the healthcare space. Some people looked at this and said, "I actually, this is." Uh, what I want. Yeah, Descartes, Amazon. I mean, we started looking at this and started looking at where we're going, and then we saw some of the issues, particularly of uh, characters versus digits. 
Okay, so the the other kind of major uh, change that was proposed is um, is related to this fact that um, you may have multiple devices that are actually all the same. So take, for example, a, a Roku device. Uh, if you have, say, two TVs, you may have two Rokus, both authorizing to YouTube or, or whoever, um, and both would actually have the same client ID. Uh, and so th there is a proposal around, okay, so if, if they both have the same client ID and the user, say, loses upgrades or sells or it's stolen or something, if, if one of those devices is gone, how do they revoke just that one device? As, as written, the, the spec is, uh, doesn't really provide any help to the authorization server to provide a good revoke experience. I guess you could look at when the token was last used, but that probably doesn't help a whole lot if someone uh, bought it off you and is continuing to use it. So um, this, this is uh, an addition. Um, it doesn't really change the actual protocol at all. It just passes a little bit more information about the device to the authorization server it, to allow the authorization server to store this information, these three fields associated with the grant. Um, the motivation is, is for revoking. So uh, let me give you an example with the, with the Roku. Um, the device ID would be a, a unique ID of the, of the Roku. Um, the purpose to provide that is so that that device can be represented as a single entity for revocation. So you could have multiple apps from the same authorization server. With one click, the user could revoke that entire device. Um, the second is the model, just so the, um, you know, hopefully this is available to the app. They can just like kind of query like, what am I running on? Like, oh, it's an Xbox 360, it's a Xbox One or whatever, which, which may actually have the same client ID depending on, on the implementation. And then the final is, and you know, this would be extremely optional. They're all optional, but this would be the most optional. It's kind of like, does the device actually have a name? If so, pass that as well. So then you can imagine this revoke experience where it's, oh, William, you know, you have a, a Chromecast and a Roku and another Roku or something, and, and it's like living room Roku, and, and you can kind of just revoke that and, and uh, yeah. Annabelle Backman, Amazon. This problem doesn't seem unique to the device flow to me. Uh, it would equally apply to uh, native apps running on mobile devices where you do have rich user input and you are uh, potentially entering credentials right on the device. So this spec does not feel like the right place to solve this problem. You are absolutely right that any native app has the same problem and Justin has a spec from 2010 to sell you. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so he, he kind of had this idea all those years ago. I hadn't actually seen that until, until recently. Um, we kind of came up with this to try and solve that revocation experience. Uh, there was another contribution on the list as well that was similar. Um, I will point out that the device authorization endpoint is, strictly speaking, a different endpoint. So while we, for better or worse, reuse some uh, parameter names across the two endpoints, I and given this is in working group last call, just from a, well, about to be again, from a kind of process point of view, I think we could document this here if this was an acceptable pattern. And um, I mean, if we really wanted to, we could review these names and maybe not call it device. Um, but I guess, I don't, I don't disagree. I, I guess I'm just not sure exactly like, how, how do we solve it like now for the device flow? And, and given we would actually need to document it separately, um, you know, it doesn't matter, I guess. Uh, I, I think if we end up with two different ways to do the same thing, that you know, creates a lot of confusion for, for implementers. Uh, my other concern here is that if we are overly prescriptive about what pieces of information we're asking for, for uh, device identification, um, we run the risk of ruling out use cases where right. potentially we need more than just these three pieces of information that we've identified here that work for the cases people are immediately familiar with. Okay, two points about that. So one, one is they are optional. Um, so for example, like I know there are some devices that may not have an ID, so don't send it. You know, it's, st it's still useful from a, a UX perspective to know the name of the device. You can still perhaps do some useful things uh, around that, particularly if it has a name that could be unique and the user can still differentiate, even if, even if there's no like, even if you can't correlate the different grants in order to revoke the device at once. Um, yeah. On the other point, uh, what was the other point? <laughs> William, um, I think this issue came up in Chicago already, like in a question of like, what are we actually uh, identifying in terms of client? Uh, and there, I had the impression that we uh, also talked a little bit more about, uh, 
more extended functionality than just having some parameters that are obviously non-cryptographic. Uh, so one could argue that maybe you actually want to uh, do some form of uh, authentication, potentially attestation of stuff you, you had been proposing in, in a different context that would actually be appropriate here as well. Because those are, those are parameters, you use them for revocation, but you actually, as the title says, you may actually use them also for authorization. Um, okay. I mean that's not as not as yeah, obviously here, you can't use them here yeah. now because they're just clear text. Um, like yeah. you could the device could just pick them. Um, I guess I guess actually to your other point to that, you know maybe these aren't enough parameters. Um, my hope is that you know if if there is a common minimum set that we think a lot of devices need. Um, you know for interop reasons, let's let's document that common minimum mm -hmm. set. I, I guess not trying to capture the every possible uh, field ever, um, but I mean I I do have a very specific a use case and a reason for including these, for potentially including these parameters. Like, I mean, honestly, I don't really mind if, if that doesn't get included. This is something that you can always document separately. And you can say like, hey, if you're talking to Google, like, why don't you just add these and then we can give you a better uh, revocation experience. Um, I, we have a use case for this. Uh, I think it's a reasonable use case. So I'm, I'm keen here, any others? I don't personally, I haven't actually personally seen the attestation or anything like that um, in the wild, but uh, I guess. Sure. The attestation is obviously on the sort of more extreme end. Uh, in the middle, there would be some form, a cryptographic form of this, uh, and and this is sort of like on the on the on the on the other extreme. It's basically right. some parameters that the device can easily sort of free flow. Right. Okay. I guess I don't really have a strong comment on, on that proposal, but um, I mean, I, I do. Uh, okay. <laughs> so the device ID is problematic because if you're just declaring it, there's no binding, tying, that's not an attestation, right? You're trying to say I'm a particular device and yeah. anything could do that. The other two are useful from a UX and, and cause the user is not gonna know whether it's the right device ID thing easily or anything, right? So what you're trying to do is, is it in the authorization on the web app or whatever app the user is when they're deciding whether they wanna enable this device is you can be showing the model and the name as part of that to sort of complete the flow of am I authorizing the device that's showing me a display here? And so the device would show, here's the model, here's the name, um, to help circulate, complete that, and so that later on when you want to revoke it, you know it's the right one. But also it helps you from knowing you're authorizing the right one. Right. Yeah. yeah, so the device ID suggestion is just as a, as a crawlable ID for revocation, just so you can, it, it, it's not for, meant to be cryptographic. For who, for who to use? Um, for, for the authorization service, they can present like a, yeah, they can just group the grants together. Do you see a security issue with potentially, like, do you see, you know, if someone baked, I, I agree that it's uh, fakeable. So, do you, you know, is it bad if that gets like grouped together for I'm revocation? I'm trying to understand the value. So uh, the, the, the value the user, is um, the user is not going to really look so at. So the it. value is, uh, let's say, the one authorization server has two apps, say like um, YouTube, Google Play mu uh, Music, right? <clears throat> and so I have two devices, uh, you know, living room Chrome, um, Roku, and like bedroom Roku, and then. Rather than having like four four things displayed on for revocation, we, we could just have two, for example, right? It could just be, okay, you have the, the living room Roku and the bedroom Roku, and if you revoke one of them, it revokes both grants. So just knowing which are different clients, right? Which are different client IDs. So knowing, uh, well, potentially. Right, but each of those would have a separate device name from the user experience. Right? May or may not. That could be both Wolves Roku. If all of this is happening at the authorization server side, there's no reason for the device to be passing this information and in. the authorization server can just assign a surrogate ID to each of those authorizations. Uh, yep, but in that example I gave you, would then have four discrete authorizations, two times two. Um, you wouldn't be able to group them. I see, I see. Okay, yep. that's, that's fair. Yeah, so that, 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 that's, that's why this one exists oh, explicitly this, this to group the four to into two. This essentially remove all, this, all the things from a particular device, because assuming the device will provide the same ID right. all the time. Okay. I, I, yeah, assuming that. If it doesn't, it's useless. Um, right. So yeah, it's just, just to conceptualize all the grants and group them. Um, so that, that's the purpose of one, of, mm -hmm. of ID, and then the other two are. Regarding so, model and name, they yep. do introduce a potential phishing risk if the authorization server is not validating those against uh, a, a, a whitelist uh, associated with the client ID. Um, and if you're requiring the authorization server to do that, I'm not 
sure how much value it then you know, having the client provide this information but really, it would be really difficult gives you. to just uh, use the client ID because in this case you have one client ID but then use it on a, on many different devices so you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily know or you would definitely not know the device name uh, or the authorization server wouldn't be able to infer the device name just from the client ID because if the, you have the app running on thousands of uh, millions of yeah, devices, I, maybe I, I'm I'm more concerned about device model. Okay. Because oh. if if you're if you're displaying that to the user and telling them, hey, you're registering a Roku three, um, but the client ID that's being provided is for some other device. Yeah. Um. Then you know you so. Yeah, I guess two, two comments on that. Uh, the last one first. So you said, what is the value of the client providing this information? I, I would say one of the value is that, assuming uh, legitimately provided information, is that at, at revocation, you know, if I just see some random thing, it's like, what's that? I can't remember authorizing it. I'm going to revoke it, right? But if it says, hey, this is like your, your Roku, don't revoke, you know, this is your Roku, I'm like, oh, gee, I, I don't want to revoke that. So that's the value of the client providing it. It's an optional parameter, but if they provide it, they're at less risk of getting revoked. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not trying to endorse Roku, by the way. It's just a good, uh, I, I'm more concerned about a, a malicious uh, a party using yeah, yes, a phishing yes. request to okay, put up a, a prompt that's saying I'm authorizing my Roku 3 when I'm actually authorizing. Yes. You know, but I, I think what you're pointing so, to is the fact that those parameters are essentially right, mintable and right. they are not cryptographic. Okay. Uh, right. Two, two comments on that. Um, Firstly, if we add this, let's make sure we do add that security consideration. That's a great point. Um, a, a lot of the thinking I was doing around this was revocation, but you're talking about consent. Yeah. I think from a consent point of view, uh, I agree. You you might want to have a whitelist. So he, here's one possible implementation. This is not, not wouldn't be normative, but you could have say like a known list of ten. Um, that way, you're not just rendering random attacker provided text. Mm -hmm. But and let's say it's like Xbox. I think um, you know the. The advantage of that is when I said before is like one of the main questions we're asking trying to pre prevent against phishing is, is this your device and is it in your possession right now? Um, being able to say, is this your Xbox? Um, now, if that was from a whitelist of 10, I, I don't particularly see how replacing this device with Xbox w would be bad. Mm -hmm. I definitely see replacing this device with random hacker provided text would be bad. So I think, right. yeah, I think you make a good point. Yeah. Um, is security considerations text is good. Uh, I'll go back to the kind of earlier points about implementers and clients not always reading the spec. Um, so we should weigh the, the value of yeah. having that specified in the request versus derived on the authorization server side from a client ID versus the you know, weigh the convenience of that versus the risk of people doing it wrong. Right. Um, OK. Maybe it is in the doc, and I don't remember it, but there's a number of uses of this that isn't necessarily clear to everybody. Some people view that the device, there's only one thing on the device, but mm. the model is that there could actually be a bunch of other apps running on the device, and so the device knows who it is, but right. the app is trying to install and boot up, you know, so it's, you know, you're trying to enable Netflix on your Roku, right. which as opposed to just enabling the device. Right. Um, you may want to call that out because it may not be obvious to everybody. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for that point. Yeah. It, it's definitely true. Um, and, and then sometimes people are just trying to revoke the service as opposed to uh, across all devices, and sometimes they're trying to revoke the device. Right. With, and all the services aren't it. Right. So I think with, without, without this, it would always be revoking the service across all your devices um, without the ID. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, well, this one was funny because actually, uh, I guess I didn't include this in earlier drafts, but we had actually, I actually documented this, um, you know, as a proposal internally, like a bunch, bunch of months ago. So, so I'm curious to see other people. John Bradley from Yubico. So before Lucy gets up to throw this particular cold water, I'll beat her to it. That device ID is actually a correlatable identifier and many device manufacturers go to great lengths to prevent different apps on the same device from knowing that they're on the same device. So there's going to have to be some significant amount of security considerations. I, I, I'm minded to 
and privacy consideration, I'm minded to separate this from the spec that's about to go into last call. This probably needs to be its own spec and consider what how this relates both to mobile devices, uh, uh, mobile devices, uh, limited display devices, and attestations, etc. I think this is its own fairly large ball of wax. I, I think that trying to stick this into the device spec at the last minute is going to cause the whole thing to blow up in IESG review with all sorts of dis She's already got a list of discusses that would completely tie us up. So I would say don't fall into that. Let's not fall into that hole. Uh, let's get the device spec done and consider this as part of a separate add-on. Uh, Brian Campbell. Uh, um, well, are you happy for John to speak for you, or are you interested to hear your points if you're having to? If, if you're happy to let John uh, speak for you, then. Uh... <laughs> I, I think John summarized it fairly well. Okay. And if you're going through a full security audit again, I think you're at least a year out again on this document. If you want that, that's one way to go. I think you could drive a truck through this. Okay. <laughs> I, I guess in defense of these three parameters, uh, they're not—they're not trying to be anything more than just self-client asserted, you know, unencrypted, unvalidated, you know, revocation hints. <laughs> I, I think it's good that you brought this up. I, uh, I could add an underscore hint on all yeah, of them because I think uh, the the context of. Uh, of this document sort of makes the, the the whole topic more understandable rather than uh, talking about it in the abstract. That's why we hadn't had this, that discussion before. Correct. So it was a good a right. good that you raised it. But clearly, as as you can see, we can all see we need a little bit more discussion on this, uh, and then we need to make a decision on is this a separate effort or is this uh, something in there or, or are we actually doing something completely different? I I don't know. Lucy. Yeah, you mentioned several issues like multiple devices, renaming, revocation, all of which are extremely complex to manage. To add that at last call in the spec is not gonna help. Okay. Well it, I I don't I I think we shouldn't get hung up on the last call. So we thought that uh, like coming from the last IDF meeting we thought that uh, we are done, but often the last call is a way for people to look at it and actually raise things. Uh, so last call is not always the last call. Uh, so, so I think this is it's, it's as good as any other time to raise these issues. You see Justin. Oh, Justin. Yeah, Justin. I don't know, I don't know what the order was. Yeah. So uh, a couple of things about that. Uh, one, actually, this this loops back into Mike's question earlier of you know why are people bringing up all these things now? And part of it is that this spec has sat kind of pseudo stable and dormant for years. So. People have actually been implementing this for a really long time in non-standard, but mostly kind of compatible ways. And so now that it's finally going through the standardization process, uh, people are starting to pay attention to, oh, wait, does this actually fit the use case that we've been deploying for five years? Uh, so that's where some of this stuff is shaking out. Uh, we are also really seeing a, uh, a bend in the curve of adoption of um, sort of alternate modality uh, devices, voice first devices, IoT devices and things like that, where this stuff kind of does make sense. Um, and uh, in addition, we do have uh, some interesting use cases like the one I posted about on the list from one of my clients where um, you know, this this mode really does make sense, but it's only very recently that this kind of stuff has been coming up. So this is the right time for uh, for all of this to get hammered out. And uh, I think that's why we're seeing that. All that said, uh, everything I'm hearing uh, is that this stuff belongs in a separate spec. Uh, I threw a link to just such a spec into the chat just now, because I don't know, I thought it was a good idea back in 2010. And um, in, uh, in any event, um, I agree with the sentiment that, uh, that this really should kind of um, live in its own space because what Annabelle said is also true. This applies to more than just the device flow.
So we're not just talking about device mm. ID. Uh, in my original spec, I called it instance identification because I was thinking more in terms of uh, like, I think it was Dick was saying like public clients and a bunch of other things. This has applicability beyond other things. And as has been brought up, it's a big ball of wax. So I am, uh, I am with the thing, uh, with the sentiment that it is um, too much to try to just slip this in here at the last minute because we can do this in a standardized way across multiple flows that does address all of the security and privacy and other considerations um, as a separate document. Justin, can you post the document that you mentioned uh, to the mailing list rather than to some chat? I window? did actually. It's um, it's on the thread that's uh, discussing this. Do it just yes. from like, okay, the last um, week or two. For purposes of the minutes, what's the draft? Uh, draft Richard OAuth instance dash zero zero. Thanks, Justin. Um, yeah, my response that would be. Uh, I'm inclined to agree. I guess I, I've been working on like the native apps stuff for a while, and we definitely saw the same problem there. So, um, if you'd like any help, um, you know, reviving that doc, I'd be very willing. Uh, it's Brian from Ping. Uh, this may be moot at this point, but I, I had just one comment about the device ID that may be still useful. There seem to be a lot of concerns and about the stability, uh, verifiability, and privacy concerns of the device ID. When what I'm hearing is there's a very specific use case for using it to group authorized apps for the same authorization server system from the same device, which right. um, I understand, but maybe it could, maybe this the same sort of things could be accomplished with just some sort of model or name or nickname or nickname hint, giving up the groupability use case. Um, but if you think about like my Roku, I, I'm authorized with. Yeah with YouTube and Pandora and Netflix and so and those are different services right. so they, there's no right. even physical way to there's no way to group those anyway I have to go to the different things yep. so maybe within a single service having to give up that particular grouping is uh, is worthwhile in terms of avoiding some of the other issues you said maybe we could accomplish this with what uh, he's just saying maybe Maybe the grouping is not I just want to hear what he said uh, no uh, maybe the, the, gr the grouping functionality could be dropped um, in, in favor of just a name hint yeah, in, what, what was the thing you were proposing basically just dropping device ID right. from this yeah. and I was and I was using different names like hint just to yeah to okay. maybe alleviate other fears but but really just taking the device ID and the grouping yeah. out of it might be a, a way to accomplish more or less the same usability functionality with one small loss um, and, and maybe getting rid of a lot of the concerns around privacy. Yeah, just one, one bit of feedback on that. The, the only thing is, I, I guess, I sort of see that users mostly visualize their their equipment as, as devices, not as like YouTube on my Roku and like play music on my Roku. I think the, the mental model is more like, hey, I'm like, he, he, you know, I don't want my Roku anymore. Here it is, Brian, you, you take it. But I better go in and like delete my account from it. and and. I think I think that Mandel model does suit it, but yeah, I I, I agree. You're saying it's a trade-off, and and maybe it's just not worth the worth the cost. So just a thought. Um, yeah, that. absolutely. Um, well, maybe we should consider that with with the uh, with. And we should also look a little bit at the time. With the yes, two more well, presentations. Uh, yes, uh, it was a great discussion. Uh, don't want to restrain restrict you in any way, but uh, all right, I I can get through the rest in thirty seconds. Yeah. So uh, so just to reiterate. Uh, Brian's comment because all you need is a locally scoped identifier. You, need, you don't need a globally scoped identifier. The global one is a problematic one. Absol absolutely, right. and and I think the um, the locally scoped one is preferred from a privacy point of view. I agree. So it's like a publisher device. Um, right. It so. probably needs to be pairwise in the way that we're doing other things pairwise, and may relate to some of the stuff that we're doing around logout. So, or, or token revocation, et cetera, because right. it really is by whoever is doing the authorization. So yeah. the SID or there may be other things that are more appropriate than a device ID, which is why pulling it back and looking at it 
yeah. from a broader perspective. Okay. Possible. Well, I mean, I'm sensing a fair bit of consensus, at least, to, to look at that uh, as, a, as an option um, in the future. Great. All right. Well, glad we had the discussion. Uh, let me just wrap this up. <laughs> there are no more new changes to propose. So uh, just to go over a bit of running code, a um, bit of an update. Um, Google's AS is actually now 100% spec compliant with the 06 version. Um, hooray. We had, there was like one difference since uh, IETF 98, um, and I don't think we invalidated that today. <laughs> so <laughs> let's hope not. Uh, MITRE ID, uh, I believe 1.3 should be released now since it was uh, about to be get released in Chicago. Uh, that's another. And uh, this one's an open source implementation of the server side. We have also an open source uh, client implementation. Um, the plan is to move this into the AppAuth project, which uh, once it's actually standardized um, and um, Justin and I did some interop between the two. So yeah, there we go. And I think we've done the discussion. But in, in all fairness, there's a couple of other open source implementations. Uh, oh, right. Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm not trying to uh, not trying to exclude any. So I, I guess if, yeah, if, please. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have to write them up and include them. In Great. Yeah. Well, and send them through the list, because um, I'm yeah. not sure if I, if I have that list. Okay. Uh, I would definitely include in, in the slides if I did. All right. Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate the, the discussion. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, William. All right, uh, OAuth to token exchange uh, it's been out there for a while. In fact, I think it was the last time in Prague that I uh, came and butted heads with Mike a little bit trying to reverse the direction of this, and we came to some uh, compromises to move forward, uh, which which were done shortly thereafter. And that was about two years ago. So um, yeah, here we are. That's a picture from last time we were in Prague. Uh, next slide, please. So I try to give a little bit of context, even though it's been around for a long time, um, just for people that aren't totally familiar with it, a reminder. And this is a, a slide of one specific use case that's available with Token Exchange. Token Exchange is, is an extension to OAuth that allows for basically arbitrary exchange of tokens some client, doesn't matter who it is, has a token, needs to get a different token in, for some other context of use. Um, and token exchange is just a framework to facilitate that. One particular use case that, that we hear a lot is a client in step zero obtains a regular old OAuth token through whatever flow, device flow, <laughs> authorization code flow, it doesn't matter. It gets one through a normal OAuth flow and it has it. And it sends it in step one to the resource server through a normal, you know, RFC 6750 uh, request with the bearer authorization here. And the resource server receives that. But it needs to get a new token with similar content suitable for a backend service that it has. So it does in steps two and three, it does a token exchange here, sends that token up to the authorization server in exchange for a, for a different token that is suitable to send to the backend server, and then passes that along just as, a, as an authorization. Um, token as well. This isn't the only use case, um, but it's one that's that's enabled by by this protocol and is pretty common. So um, these these two steps really the, the spec encompasses send a token in, get a token back. Now there's some other concepts in that you can you can send two tokens which allow for you to express um, types of uh, uh, delegation and so forth, but but at its heart it's really just exchange a token or two for another token that can be used in a different context. Um, these, uh, these, the the wire examples here are actually examples from the first part of the specification. If you want to look in detail at it, but uh, just trying to give a little bit of context, because the next slide doesn't have a lot of context. Please, just a status update. So, uh, draft nine of this was published earlier in July uh, with pretty small changes, um, which were addressing uh, working group last call feedback. And I, I do highlight here that these were addressing what I feel like are actionable and meaningful working group last call feedback. Um, there was one set of comments from someone that um, has made a lot of other comments on this and other specifications that are, are, are not necessarily meaningful or actionable. Um, and I've, I've addressed them to the best extent that I can, but I don't think that there's anything 
additional that can be done. I don't think he represents uh, any sort of consensus opinion. And I further yeah, believe... Rif Rifat and myself will, will look we'll carefully at his uh, comments if you would and discuss like it with him to, to see, because sometimes for some, uh, also for some newcomers and he hasn't been active on the, in the group directly, uh, so it maybe it sometimes be a, a language issue, it's like a, a terminology, language, etc. issue. Certainly possible. Uh, just for what it's worth, he's been active in a number of other groups with sure. um, consistent behavior. But the things that we have changed based on that, uh, changed one word from a non-normative um, can to uh, may, just to try to clarify things. That was actually a result of his feedback. Uh, added a, a statement clarifying that the validity of the subject token or actor token, the tokens you send in, their validity has no bearing on the validity of the token that's been returned outside of the context of the exchange. So they have to be valid when you exchange them, but there's no correlation implied thereafter. So once you have a new token, it's, it's, it's decoupled from the original token. Um, that's always been the intent in the case where there was some wording out of, out of what last call feedback that, that asked to clarify that. We did change one um, error code from a may use in a certain context around um, requested resources being uh, inappropriate or unable to fulfill. I had a may in there, which I, I it, it should have been a should, I think. In, in retrospect, I, I think it was just a careless wording at the time, so we, we tightened it up a little bit. Um, clarified text, uh, it's the same normative stuff about using non-identity claims within the act claim um, and them being meaningless so that you shouldn't use them there. And uh, added a little bit of privacy considerations. Actually, I stole some wording from um, from WS Trust to sort of be uh, all encompassing about the privacy considerations of this use because it's it's very difficult to cover them all. But I wanted to um, address some feedback that those were missing and and provide a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, guidance or at least awareness of of the privacy considerations involved. So those are the changes that have been made. Um, uh, they're all relatively minor, as I said. So uh, yeah, next steps. Next steps here is I'm, I'm um, pending your review of, of the other feedback and um, discussions with, with people. Um, I would ask that we transition this to uh, waiting for write-up and or moving forward. And this is a photograph of a busker in Prague um, that I'm not exactly sure what I meant by it, but it, it feels a little bit like the state of this draft, sort of like waiting in boredom, but with some sort of impending danger of this giant <laughs> snake around his neck at the same time. Um, but it, is, it was Prague related. I like photos, and and so you can uh, you can interpret that how you will. Good. Uh, are there any immediate comments on this document, or are you guys are you guys good? We had a working group last call, as we decided uh, at the last IDF meeting, and the plan was to wrap this up and and ship it. Okay. All right. That went a lot better than. Williams? No, then Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I expected it, but you never know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Only this minor changes. <clears throat> Only editorial changes. So. All right. The other the other presentation I have today uh, has a very similar title, and I get confused um, typing in URLs and end up with the wrong one all the time. But this is uh, OAuth two token binding. Here we have another photograph from Prague the last time we were here, because uh, that's what I want to do. So I'll try to set a little context here without getting too deep into it. Uh, this, this draft is intended to provide an OAuth 2 proof of possession mechanism. Uh, we talked a lot about the value of proof of possession on, uh, on Monday, I believe it was, in, in terms of what, what that can bring you in terms of preventing issues with lost or stolen access tokens. So this is a, one mechanism to provide that proof of possession um, and defeat you know, play or replay, inadvertent play by the wrong party of lost or stolen tokens in the OAuth context. And that, that includes access tokens, refresh tokens, and authorization codes. Uh, next, please. So current status here, uh, jumping out of the context into the weeds. Um, the token binding working group documents, uh, there's three of them, TLS negotiation, the protocol itself, the message format, and how it all applies to HTTP are all very, very close to being submitted to the ISG for publication. Uh, my understanding is that they're waiting for the uh, working group chair go ahead and or the shepherd write up. If any of you know the chairs of that working group, <laughs> I can't quite recall who they are. 
um, <laughs> perhaps you could uh, encourage them to uh, continue that work. I believe there are also recently some uh, NIT fixes on the drafts, which are very minor but important yeah, in. He's working. <laughs> Anyway, it, they are in a relative, relatively good state and, and very, very close. So um, that's good. In this draft, the OAuth token binding, uh, draft four of that was published um, also early in July. Apparently, I did it on the same day. Um, there's some very minor editorial fixes. Um, more clearly defined how to convey the token binding information um, of an access token in an OAuth to token introspection response. Uh, this itself was um, is very similar to the work that was done in the MTLS bit um, around OAuth, o around token introspection, all catalyzed from a comment that Justin made at the last uh, last IATF meeting, which was that there was a lot of assumptions being made about how this would work um, with introspection that were not clearly stated in the document. So this just just calls them out very explicitly. Um, and as a part of all this, there is now an introspection request. Um, introspection response parameter request registration to IANA being made in the OAuth MTLS specification, um, which sort of uh, broadly encompasses all of this and uh, is applicable here because we're using the confirmation method as well. Um, my expectation is that that document will progress um, more quickly than this document, so I put the registration request there um, and then removed an open issue related to that. And again, just clarified exactly how that would work. Um, and I also added an, a, a long rambling open issue about the need to allow for a web server based client to opt out of having refresh tokens bound um, while still allowing for access tokens themselves to be bound. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, on the next slide. So getting into open issues in the document, <laughs> um, I'm defying the conventional wisdom here about having a lot of text on a slide, mostly because I wasn't sure how to uh, narrow all this stuff down to a slide and it's meant more for me to uh as a reminder of what to talk about you get a picture of that william yeah. excellent um so one of the open questions that's been there from the beginning is what should we do in the case that a refresh request for a token bound access token is received but the refresh token itself uh was not token bound it's a it's a fair question it leads into the next question which i won't read the whole thing but it's about web server clients so token binding um at its core is developed for use cases where there are many, many, many different clients, web browsers, um, native applications on phones. And it's a nice way to sort of dynamically create additional trust and bind tokens from those individual devices. When it's brought into uh, uh, the OAuth fold, there are different kinds of clients. And one of those clients is, is potentially a web server, uh, uh, you know, Facebook, from its web servers acting as a client calling services at Amazon. And token binding of a refresh token in that context is a significant issue because those web server clients are likely distributed um, across many different nodes, very likely geographically distributed uh, across different data centers, maybe even different cloud providers hosting them. And shared access to a private key is oftentimes um, cumbersome or impossible in such environments. And this is all before we get to the question of what token binding client-side APIs are gonna look like. And my expectation is that what is already a, a very cumbersome, sometimes impossible problem will not be made any easier by the APIs that are provided around token binding because they're really meant to be, um, they're not ephemeral keys, but they're, they're sort of on-demand ge on generated client-side keys that um, adapting those APIs to be able to also securely store private keys and share them with the entire set of your clustered applications is, uh, it, it's not gonna happen. Um, I think there will be a, a small subset of implementations that could figure out how to do it. They will be in the vast minority. And I think if we don't address this problem, it will severely hinder the adoption of token binding in this context. And the real value of token binding um, in this context is to bind the access tokens to prevent them from being um, misused or replayed in other contexts, where when we have the refresh token it is already bound to the client credentials established with the web server client. Um, oftentimes, yes, that is a, a, a client secret, but those are long, 
long client secret strings, and we also have stronger forms of client authentication that, that can accomplish similar, uh, similar benefits like mutual TLS. So um, I'm, I'm strongly advocating the need for some kind of solution here. Uh, I see two possible approaches, and one is to toggle the behavior based on some kind of client metadata. So uh, metadata, client registration metadata isn't required, but it's often used, and even when it's not used, it strongly suggests a model for client registration data, even with, with providers that do static registration and we could put some stronger text around that. But a way for uh, individual clients at registration, those that have client credentials established, private clients, to say, please do not bind um, refresh tokens for me, even though I would like um, access tokens bound. And then the, the way that access tokens are bound are by presenting the, um, the token binding information at runtime, which includes the provided and referred token binding. Um, I think that's probably the, the most straightforward uh, solution. It, it's easily implementable, easily understood. The metadata parameters already largely exist, so I think it, it would be just some, some wording around their usage and some normative language about, um, right now they're just sort of suggestive and indicative, and they could be enhanced a little bit to say, in, these, in this case where you know this indication is false, um, the authorization server should not token bind um, refresh tokens. Getting back to the refresh, uh, binding the refresh tokens to, to just sort of further complicate. The, one of the main problems is the only way to request a um, token bound access token is through the presentation of the SEC token binding header after negotiating um, token binding and including a referred token binding in that. And the only, and in order to do that, by definition of the spec, you also have to provide a pro, uh, provided token binding. So there's no way to make that request without providing the data that's right now um, in the standard said to be used for both for binding both refresh and access tokens. Um, and yeah, I'm sorry, that was a bit of a divergence, but I sort of missed saying that before. The other potential solution here. Right. It, it, yes, question. Um, Mike Jones, Microsoft. I, I'd just like to say that I think that the metadata approach is very reasonable, and I really don't want to think about what are the security and threat implications of providing a runtime way to disable the security feature. I, I think that's a, a fair um, and reasonable criticism of the option that I had not yet presented, so. Um, wait a <laughs> <laughs> oh, you alluded to it. <laughs> I, I guess I did sort of allude to it, but way to look into the future. Uh, we did discuss this a little bit yesterday to try to clarify our own thinking about it. The other option would be allow, would be to allow for some sort of parameter on the token endpoint request for the client to express the token binding ID that it would like the access tokens to be bound to. It could do that without negotiating token binding, without providing the provided token binding, which would then mean that the, the authorization server would have no way to bind the refresh token, but it would have data sufficient to bind the access tokens. Um, I was, I was kind of liking this approach for a while. Um, I, I think there may be other simplifications of client-side APIs that it allows for. I, I actually think the security implications are okay in this context. But having said all that, I, I think that the metadata solution is is more straightforward, easier to implement, and solves addresses the immediate problem, and um, doesn't open up any potential security issues that I, I'm not aware of, even though I think it's okay, um, and continues to use consistent behavior around um, around how token binding is conveyed and verified and so forth at the at, at the token binding for HTTP layer. So. Um, at, at this stage, I'm inclined to um, suggest, request that, that uh, the, the next revision of the document um, include addressing actually both of these issues uh, based on client metadata, because the client metadata um, can also take care of the, the uh, understanding or at least clarifying what to do in cases where uh, access token and, and refresh token don't have the same binding information. Uh, John Bradley, Ubico. I vote for option one. I think option two has a couple of decomposable points. I don't, a runtime switching is going to cause problems. There may be other reasons to have token binding negotiated on that TLS connection. Um, I think 
there is a separate issue lurking in there whether or not we need a separate parameter for for being able to express the referred token binding separate from the referred token binding in the token binding header. Uh, but I think that's kind of a separate issue. So I, I think dealing with it in metadata, saying it's OK with sufficiently strong client authentication, because in principle, you want to authenticate the client if it's a server. Uh, we could direct people to use uh, sign jot or or other stronger mechanisms so they're not pass using HTTP basic and passing the the that on the on the line so I think we can give good advice about using mutual TLS sign jots etc in combination with <coughs> token binding for the for the access tokens I think we still need to have a discuss a discussion point on whether or not in these clustered environments it's actually reasonable that the token binding API that's provided can get the referred token binding from another node or can we should we be saying ah yes the node that's going to use the access token has to be the node that's use getting the refresh token so th there's more discussion that needs to happen on that particular I, I agree with it, but it is separable from here so I think leaning towards metadata um. William Dennis, uh, I don't know if you explicitly called this out, so I just wanted to ask, is, is this only for confidential clients? Um, I don't think I explicitly called it out, but yes. Okay. So okay. thanks for the clarification. Great. Yeah, because I guess like a native app, for example, doesn't have the, it's not only is it not confidential, but it's also shouldn't be distributed. So that's right. It probably <laughs> falls in the category of, hey, you really should token bind your refresh tokens. Yes. Um, and secondly, I guess, uh, like ideally, we want everyone to be using token binding for OAuth eventually. Um, so, ideally. yeah, I guess the only risk I would see is like, you know, if, if we allow too many people to opt out of too many things, then they may just like, oh, it's too hard to implement it. So, I don't know if you have any thoughts on how to encourage, you know, people to still bind their access tokens even if they click the opt out box for for the refresh token. Uh, um, I, I hadn't thought about it so much in in that context. More the other side of it that I, I felt like not providing this opt out would de facto mean that people won't be able to implement right. it. So, um, but I, I think some, there may be some guidance or, or wording around this that that helps mm -hmm. uh, address or alleviate those, right. those issues. Like for example, could you see a world where refresh token binding, like potentially where refresh token binding is optional, but access token binding could be compulsory like for a particular authorization server? And I'm saying like in five years, but like, yeah. is that a possible outcome from, from, from this design? Yeah, I think so. Uh, John Bradley again. So we, we do have the mutual TLS option, and in some cases, mutual TLS for access tokens might better fit somebody's deployment use case. So I wouldn't say maybe mandatory proof of possession access tokens. There may be more than one mechanism for doing that. But he, um, he did say in, in the context of a particular authorization server might very yeah. well. Well, um, but even a particular authorization server might. Might, but you could, yeah. So we don't want to be overly prescriptive but I mean the concern I think at the moment is the only way for somebody to turn off being broken because they have a cluster and by default the refresh tokens are, are being token bound would be to disable token binding on their calls to the to the token endpoint which mean that they can't do um, access tokens token bound access tokens so this at least allows somebody to have that to be able to do Token bound access tokens without uh, without token binding the refresh token. Correct. So this is a first step, not necessarily the whole world. Agreed. William Dennis, just to clarify, I wasn't saying that we should be prescriptive in that sense, but just that a, a particular authorization server itself could say, for for, for us, uh, access token token binding is mandatory. Still, even with this sort of relaxation, even if they implement this metadata uh, yeah. relaxation. I think so. All right, great. Next one. Uh, it's a little better. A um, couple more open is open issues. One is a um, question of whether the scope of this document should include some kind of standardization or at least uh, guidance on using token binding with uh, JOT client authentication and or authorization. Um, 
from uh, yeah the 7523, which is the job client authentication authorization draft. Um, in in some ways, I feel like this is uh, easily inferred from the existence of the confirmation claim, how it's used and and would be used in this you know in this context. In other ways, uh, it might be useful to to say something about it here because um, I think it is particularly for client authentication. It, it's maybe a really nice, useful security enhancement mechanism. Um, but right now, it's not in there, and it would it's sort of left up to the imagination or an exercise to the reader. Uh, John, yes, we should write it down because it's only self-evident to us using the confirmation claim in a self-signed jot for client authentication. If from the look on Hannes's face, yes, it is actually just self-evident to us. It, you're, you're right, the, the scope of people to whom it's self-evident is probably relatively small. Um, as a co-author in the document, what I'd specifically welcome do your, you want to like uh, give us a, a short summary of what you would like to write down. Uh, since John's in favor, of it, I'd love for him to write it down. But since I know that sure. won't happen, uh, it would be a <laughs> it would be a, it's probably a small subsection of the document that describes how one would use the uh, confirmation claim with the uh, TBH token binding hash confirmation method inside of it mm -hmm. in the context of the uh, Jot client authentication. Not uh, yeah, not real controversial. Yeah, looking forward to see it there. Okay, yeah. Um, and then this was uh, this is all sort of related, but the metadata needs some work. Um, the main problem I think is that there's a a reference to the OAuth two protected resource metadata, which is not a, a, an ongoing draft. So we've got a kind of a hanging dead reference. I think. Um, it needs to be re removed and some um, some clarity about what can and cannot actually be inferred um, at runtime from the metadata values and what can be enforced uh, should be added there. Um, this has been sort of an ongoing reminder uh, to myself that it exists as well as a, a hope that Mike that wrote the original text would, would uh, go back and fix it. Um, although we, we chatted a little bit about this uh, yesterday and in the context of a similar problem with the OpenID Connect layer uh, token binding spec that has similar issues. And I believe, uh, I believe I have some ideas basically about a, a roadmap about how to, how to keep the same intent, remove the hanging reference, and clarify the text in a meaningful way. So uh, I think we're good on that. Um, and certainly anything that's written will be another draft and available for review. I don't know. So uh, it's on my list to do. Um, like I said, these were just listing the open so, issues. So what, what do you, so be a little bit more precise, what do you want to do there? Like uh, you want to remove that reference and? Uh, that reference in that particular metadata field are going to go away. Mm -hmm. And there will be um, the, the text around what's currently there of, of detecting attacks, what to do in cases where. Uh, bound tokens are expected but not received um, will be just reworded to, to clarify what, what, what is and isn't possible and, and perhaps provide some guidance on what to do. All right, next slide please. So just looking ahead, um, hopefully the, the core underlying token binding documents progress to RFC here pretty soon. I know Andre is looking forward to that, uh, even though he's not listening right now. Um, work through these open issues. I think I have a way forward for a lot of them, so that's good. Uh, we definitely need implementation experience and feedback here. There's there's growing implementation experience in token binding in general, but most of the client side implementation is currently in the browser. So uh, we haven't seen like client side widely available libraries yet. Um, server side's also questionable, but coming along. Um, so I, this is still early. I think there's a lot of room to learn and 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 work from there, but um, it's progress. And uh, then get the band back together again at uh, IETF 100 in uh, in Singapore. And here's a uh, John Belushi impersonator, uh, just to just to help you get the band back together and get in the mood for it. That's all I've got. Uh, Dick Hart, Amazon. In the current token binding, it it uh, are with access tokens. Um, we're not really dealing with a TLS proxy around how do we. Um, push that proof of possession all the way through to the application and preserving that uh, integrity. Um, is that viewed out of scope for this document or is that in scope? 
I would view that as out of scope for this document because it prescribes how it's done with OAuth. Um, there is a document that was just accepted as a working group item in the token binding working group that describes uh, how to convey the information from the TLS terminating layer as a reverse proxy, convey the token binding information that was verified to any applications in the back end, which would allow them to, to, to do what's implied by the, the OAuth layer. Uh, which is trust in the TLS layer around what yes. it's doing. Yes. Right. Yep. Um, so that doesn't provide the same uh, security characteristics of other proof of possession mechanisms that go from client directly to the application. That's correct. Um, so is there not interest in doing, I mean, I consider it an OAuth problem because it's a proof of possession type token. We're trying to go and add proof of possession into OAuth to flow, which is, you know, a protocol that works at the application layer as to how do we get that signal uncompromised and securely all the way to the application layer. So you're saying that you don't consider that to be in scope for OAuth? The token binding is really how do I move this? It's, the it's bound. in scope for OAuth, but it's not in scope for this document. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It, I mean, the it, it's in scope. It's not in scope for this document, and the the technical solutions right now rely on um, some kind of established trust between the TLS terminator and the application, um, and that's that's the work that's going on. Well, you could argue, Brian, uh, that. For example, the, the document that Justin has been working on with the HTTP signing is such an application layer pop, uh, approach. Whether it's the right one or not is a separate story, but... Uh, yeah, that's true. So this is a this is a TLS layer binding approach. Yeah. And with all the pros and cons. With, yeah, yeah. With, with, with everything that comes in with that. Um, Does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah, I think you know Microsoft had something internally that they were using around how did they move that, c continue the signal all the way through to the application. Mm -hmm. Did you? Do you want to speak about it? We do, but I don't know the mechanism well enough to speak about it at this time. Okay. Um, and I, just from a technical perspective, I, it's I don't know of a way to do it that is tightly bound because it's. It, it's bound to the TLS connection between the client and that TLS termination. So everything that happens behind that is simply moving signals, but not not something tighter than that. And if, if, if there's a, a, a practical well, way... The, the verification's happening at the application layer. That's correct. And so if the TLS proxy doesn't know the... Currently, the token's opaque. I mean, not opaque. It's visible, and so I think the Microsoft solution was they were encrypting the token, so that then the proxy wasn't able to go and see what was the EKM in the token. By okay. very well, I don't know. I mean, okay, I'm just so trying uh, to go off of what uh, there are. Okay, so nobody, nobody's one. You guys considered out of scope for this spec. And two, nobody has a clear idea about how to solve it yet. I would say that's true, but okay. to be fair, I'm not sure you clearly articulated the problem. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, well, I mean, you're talking. The, well, let me, let me articulate the, problem <laughs> the, the problem is, is that the TLS uh, terminator is in a different trust domain than the application. So okay, that we, so that is, that yeah, we, we trust. Don't. We trust the thing to terminate TLS, but we don't necessarily trust it for managing the tokens. Okay, then that I, I don't. That's certainly not in scope for this document. Okay. I don't think there's a viable technical solution using token binding. I could be wrong. Okay. I, um, but so for anybody running in AWS, right? They're having to trust the Terminator if they're sitting behind it. Yeah, which yeah. they do now. Um, uh, lots of our deployments don't. But they that's give okay. it their private key. What's that? But they provide it with their private key, right? Well, they trust them. They trust the TLS terminator to manage TLS, but they don't trust the terminator to manage the token or manage authentication and authorization. So, uh, so in in AWS, you know, API calls are done with CV4, which gives you end-to-end -end proof of possession. Okay. Right. 
which you know transit fine through a, a TLS proxy. And so, you know, ideally, we would like to use something that was more standard, but it doesn't have the the token binding and access token. The, the what you're proposing doesn't solve our problem and give us similar security characteristics around what we already have with SIG v4. Okay, I'm I'm not familiar with that. I I would encourage you to look at what's being done in the token mining group. Uh, well, I'm saying it's not going to solve the problem. Either. Yeah, oh, doesn't seem to provide uh, that. On the other side of it, I'm I'm hopeful that systems like Amazon's application layer load balancing will deploy what's being proposed in token mining right now, so you can enable your customers' applications to do token mining, both of cookies and OAuth access tokens and, and other things like that. Um. Okay. I, I think we're talking about different problems now, or at least in a different context. So, <clears throat> John Bradley, Ubico. So, I did attempt to extract the information from the devil uh, the other day um, about what Microsoft is doing for um, <clears throat> Office 365 native apps. And there is some notion that there is an additional uh, token binding ID, which is added to the token binding header, which is generated by the native app that is signing over some piece of material which is negotiated from the thing behind the proxy to the app itself. And I asked the devil to have his minions provide us with said information, but it is potentially a It's not something that would work front with, a, with browsers as deployed. Mm -hmm. It may be something that's secretly in Microsoft's library. I don't know, since he's looking He's looking at, you're looking at me like, like I'm crazy, which is probably because the devil is full of lies. Um, so, so there, there is potentially something there. We don't, I don't understand it enough to be able to write it down or adequately explain it. So perhaps if more information can be provided to this working group and the token binding working group, we can understand why Mike wants additional token binding IDs passed through and all of the other sort of intertwined issues. Sure, I, I, sounds like an OAuth issue to me, but uh, but hey, uh, yeah. so some kind of signing or application layer piece would would provide it. It's not token binding, and just to reiterate, like we, we can't write standards based on um, unknown individual deployments. We have to build them on other standards. So that that's the context with. I'm working on here. Uh, so, Andre Popov, uh, Microsoft trying to speak of the devil or on behalf. Uh, <laughs> on behalf uh, so, I'm not not entirely familiar with what was just said, right? So, like, uh, I know what the implementation of token binding looks like in Windows because I worked on that. Uh, it's it's just an implementation of the standard where we build messages where we allow the caller to specify what type of binding they want to do. So, basically, that's what we have. You know, on top of that, how a specific system uses that, I don't really know. You know, it's can't comment on that. I would be surprised if there was a solution that provided the end-to-end -end, uh, token binding validation of the type that was just discussed, because that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. If you are if you are terminating TLS at the TLS terminator, that's where end-to-end -end ends. You see what I mean? The, the the terminator. If you don't trust your TLS terminator, you know it can inject requests it can you know do all sorts of bad things you know you can you can have an architecture where the backend server actually verifies the token binding by having the TLS terminator pass the EKM and the you know token binding message to the backend but it's still not really you know end to end to the application because again you're still trusting that your TLS terminator is passing the correct information to you yep. So I am not aware of what that solution. Actually, we is. discussed this in the context of the uh, proof of possession uh, work in OWASP, and we had this write-up which we need to update uh, the architecture document that talks about these different ends and, and these different nuances, and which is right. why we had, for example, this HTTP signing solution specifically to deal exactly with the the fact that things terminate in different places, and so you have different ends in that in that communication. Um, 
we, as you all know, we ran into some issues with the HTTP signing, but uh, and, and people had entertained other ideas, uh, and maybe maybe there is um, there are different layers on what some of the deployments want to provide in terms of uh, security guarantees. Um, but I, I think it's definitely in scope of the of our work. Uh, we just have to um, come up with ideas on how to best solve it, and that had had been a problem in the past. We didn't make sort of um, rock solid. Uh, decisions and, and then move that forward. That makes sense. And I didn't. <laughs> well there are documents out there that, that at least say something. Um, but yeah. I'm not I'm not gonna I thought I had something intelligent to contribute, but I don't think I do. <laughs> well, <laughs> well it's Friday, you know. <laughs> Okay. Now would be as good a time as any. No. I, Sorry, this is Dirk from Google. I, I guess, Dick, I, then it sounds like you already have a proof of possession thing going with your particular authentication protocol that you're using. Yeah. So you're good, right? What What's the question? Dick Hart, Amazon. We have a, what I would consider a proprietary mechanism that we call SIGV4, which is how API calls in AWS are made. Um, and so that works, but it's non-standard. So we would prefer, I would prefer moving to a more standard model that worked across the internet as opposed to us having a model that works really well for us but the, doesn't work the, as we Could you it. elaborate a little bit on how your solution looks like? Because I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, so Sigby, there's a secret, you sign a request, and then that, you, you sign the request, you sign everything, and then that's verified at the application layer. So, so are you essentially saying, is, is it an HTTP-based signing mechanism, or is it uh, like a JSON-based uh, protecting some sort of constructing a, a request token, if you will? It's more HTTP-based. I'm, I'm essentially signing the whole request. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's Does a, that which is then a you know a proof of possession mechanism. Sure. Right. And Does so, that relate somehow to what Justin had uh, written up? I don't know. Okay. Okay. Uh, I yeah. believe it was. Yeah. Okay. But it prevents it pre compromised TLS property from changing your yeah. request. So I looked at the, uh, when I was writing the initial uh, HTTP signing thing, I did look at the uh, AWS solution and a few others. There's a, uh, uh, I believe it's Kavich or Karavich, I forget his last name. There's another uh, specification out there. And uh, one of the issues with a lot of um, those is that they presume um that the HTTP message itself doesn't get transformed. And that was a problem that I personally ran into a lot of with uh, OAuth 1 implementations, uh, with parameters getting reordered and added and stuff like that. Uh, so that's why my my version uh, differs. That's, that's really the main difference between uh, the one that I had proposed and these other ones, which uh, say effectively, you know, take the HTTP message, um, you know, as as presented, and do your signature on that on both ends. And uh, my understanding uh, with the AWS side is that uh, there's there's just a lot tighter control over, um, you know, where you get access to at the application layer uh, the HTTP bits, and. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely, uh, I was aware of that. It is uh, related in the sense that they are solving a lot of the same problems in similar ways, but there are some different considerations in play. But I, I hear that we sort of have an action item for Dick to look at the current, uh, actually, HTTP signing working group document, <laughs> um, which uh, I believe it's expired. That's why you, you couldn't find it on the on a page, data tracker page. So I think that would be a, a useful step and figure out whether that actually solves the issue that you're having. How does that sound? Right, and if, if people wanted to have a, 
you know, a mode of that one that just signs the pristine HTTP request. Um, that should be easily doable too. Um, so, yeah. So that doesn't build on token binding. What was that? that the audio. It, I think it may have. So uh, Dick said that it doesn't lay on top of token binding. Uh, oh, it could. It, yeah, it could it layer could. there. They're orthogonal. You could apply. Um, <clears throat> you could have a token bound proof. A proof looking of possession, possession access token where you're signing the HTTP request at the app layer and you're also doing token, uh, you're binding the token to the TLS channel. You could do both. Well, that's that oh, okay. wasn't really what I was looking for. But the feature that I like about binding is that you're not having to do uh, client management of a key. Right, so, so that's that's one of the downsides of SIGV4 is that you're having to go and manage a secret over with the client. And so token binding enables you to get many of the characteristics of proof of possession without actually having to do uh, key management um, in the client about how do you get the uh, key to a client. So I like the that characteristic of token binding, but then wanted all the secure features we still had in proof of possession all the way through to the application. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I wonder, like, what would be a reasonable next step on that issue? Is um, not it's not totally obvious to me, but. Uh, Maybe you could still have a look at the document and see, but uh, <laughs> you, you be, be, because you want you want, want to, you want token binding. You don't want to have it at the uh, published up to the application layer. You don't want to ha you want to have it standardized. You don't want to have to manage keys in the client. Uh, so you, you still have to manage keys in the client. You don't have to distribute keys to the client. Well, that's, that's, which is that's a, key. a little Di yeah. distribute. Which I understand is the hard. Distribute. It's hard part. Distribute is yeah. the hard part. Uh, it sounds like you're asking for a, a HTTP level signature with the token binding key. No, it can't be with the token binding key. Yeah, maybe. That that sounds conceptually like what mm -hmm. you're looking for, um, which is not. That's it, not. Is that possible? Uh, it's. It depends. Well, on I don't the, know whether it's possible, but I mean. We we were we like the idea of token binding, right? But and we like the idea around not having to do management around distribution of keys. Um, we have a mechanism that works now that gives us a lot of very powerful characteristics that uh, enabled our customers not to be worried when there was compromises on the TLS stack. Um, so we're reluctant to not continue to have that. And. Uh, yeah, so I'm just phrasing that you know we're interested in a solution like that. I don't necessarily know exactly how it would be solved, so I was trying to figure out whether it was in scope for this particular document because this has many of the right characteristics. It just doesn't deal with TLS proxies, which is most of all of our deployments are have a TLS proxy. So okay. yeah, so the answer is it's not currently in scope. Okay, there's work around TLS proxies that is in scope, but does but, not address yeah, the your OAuth. The, does not address your specific concern, which is not unique to OAuth. Which is fine, uh, but but I think the, the 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 issue needs to be around OAuth because we are talking about doing the application layer. Yeah, yeah to it's the an API access mechanism, and OAuth is primarily. But, but the issue to describe is also applicable to to other environments, yeah. to normal use cases, to token bound cookies. That yeah. if you trust in the TLS terminator and that. Context is exactly the same thing, but but I think but right, but token in, a, in, a, in a cookie world, there's no other mechanism, right? That the TLS is passing the cookie, and that is your existing trust model. Where in an but API you, access, what's that? Yeah, right. But the, token binding is giving tools to address that in a standardized mechanism, and those are being worked on. So, it, for cookies, sure, and for no, but you don't. This, the same issues exist with cookies. Like, it, it, there's not a magic. I'm saying in cookies, there's there's there was no binding of the whole request in the cookie from the browser all the way down, right? So you you've had, you're not losing anything in moving to token binding. That's also true in OAuth. 
So you're referencing your proprietary right, right. solution and, and wondering why uh, the standard doesn't address and saying that we're losing well, your- I'm not wondering why. I'm <laughs> saying I'd like it to be able to move up to that level of security characteristics of what we have. I, okay, I hear, I hear the request. I, I don't think it's mm -hmm. applicable here, but I- But we need to, uh, we can still discuss it on this. Can, I think, I think it sounds like it, something. Yes. Uh, having said that, uh, you may have noticed that I disconnected my laptop, uh, meaning that we, I believe we're actually done um, over time already. So thanks for showing up. Um, Mike took good meeting minutes, so we'll distribute them. And uh, yeah, thank you all for showing up and, and contributing to the work. Thanks, Mike. Thanks a lot. Oh, the blue sheet. Where's the blue sheet? <coughs> Yeah. Oh.